Okay, um, it is six o'clock. And so welcome to the August 11th Hadley School Committee, um, Hadley Public Schools meeting. Uh, is there a motion to call a meeting to order? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Let's see, do we have adjustments to the agenda tonight? Annie, I'm going back to my notes. As part of our uh, agenda, we will. I, yeah, I, I'm not sure that we do, uh, given the fact that we still have some things to uh, to work out from executive session. So I, I don't believe that there are adjustments to the agenda this evening. Okay, great. So. Um, primarily, our meeting tonight is um, not only to hear public comment, but to also have the presentations and discussion around the remote learning plans for um, the elementary school and for uh, Hopkins Academy. Great. So I will move now into public comment. Um, the protocol for public comment, there is uh, a policy that I have cited previously. Um, while I will not cap the time, for our public comment session, um, in each individual speaker is given three minutes. Um, and by indicating, uh, you can indicate your wish to participate by raising your digital hand. Um, and that digital hand should be, sorry, my view keeps changing, should be on your participants pane or in the bottom at your toolbar. And if not, just uh, please signal with a yes or a no, just that, that you just signal to us that you'd like to participate in public comment. And if you are on the phone only and not on Zoom, which I don't see anybody joining solely by phone. Um, if I do see a phone number call join, I will call out those digits just to make sure um, if folks want to join public comment, they can. So at this time, is there anyone who would like to uh, participate in public comment? Okay, seeing none, uh, we're gonna move into our discussion uh, presentation item of the remote learning plan, and then we will have another opportunity for round two of public comment after hearing those plans um, in case there are things that you would like to make sure that we are aware of or consider uh, as we move forward. Okay, um, Annie and Jen and April, I will turn it over to you for discussion around the remote learning plan. Sure, I think the first one we have is Hopkins, is that correct? And April, I know we discussed some of this on Thursday, but it might be helpful to walk folks through again what the remote learning plans that currently are uh, in the district plan. Sure. Um, so, and I know this is one of the questions, so I guess I'll start with thinking about the schedule for the remote learning plan. Um, if you look in the plan itself, it mentioned... And April, I'm sorry, just tell me what you want me to share. Too. Oh, sure. You can sh just share the plan itself if you want. Perfect. On the first page. Thank you. Sure. So in that first paragraph there, it tells you that the schedule is based on whatever schedule is being used at the time. I think one of the important things uh, to think about that we haven't quite finalized yet, right? So in here, there's a proposed schedule which starts in the bottom of um, page two into page three, which has a schedule for when students are 100% remote. That assumes that everybody in the district is remote. If for any reason, special populations were admitted to the school, um, if you continue moving down a little bit more into page three, you can see that the schedule that would be used would be the schedule that was in the cohort plan, which is that cohort to early dismissal um, to remote learning. So that's the schedule that would be used when students are in school so that the schedules would be the same for students who are remote in any of those, those special populations that would be in school at the time. In regards to attendance, which is on page two of the plan, um, all students have to follow the same exact attendance expectation. So whichever of those schedules that would be happening at that time, students would have daily and period attendance taken. DESE is requiring that we are tracking students that are both in person and remote. So even students who are, who are remote are expected to show up 
at that time for every single class. Again, all of the same practices around attendance apply. So if a student is sick and they have a cold, they still have to call in and say, my student is sick, they have a cold, that's an excused absence. It is not an exempted absence. Um, an exempted absence has to have a doctor's note. So if they went to the doctor because they were ill and they had a doctor's note, they would then submit it. All of that follows uh, our usual policy that students cannot miss more than 18 days in a school year or they don't earn credit. So that is also one big difference from the spring, right? So in the spring, both attendance and grading policies were not exactly the same. Desi's made it very clear that all of those policies are going to be the same. So attendance is the same no matter where anyone is. So there are some notes about that in particular in the remote plan. It's not different in the remote plan than in in-person, but I did want to emphasize it because some people might not realize that. So I wanted to make that clear. So similarly on that first page, going into the second page, it mentions grading and assessments. So as I was just saying, in remote, all of the grading and assessments are per usual department policy and practice. So where a student might usually have an essay uh, that might be weighted a certain amount, in person, it'll be exactly the same remote. Now, some teachers may opt to alter or modify some assessments, knowing that in remote learning, um, you know, perhaps a presentation might be a better medium and perhaps the skill being thought at the time isn't writing. So again, departments would have to work together to figure out what might change looking at the curriculum and the standards. But the regular curriculum and the standards would all be used and any decisions around that would be made with department approval at Hopkins. The platform to deliver that curriculum is going to be Google Classroom for all teachers. And that's not to say that they can't use Google Classroom and link it to something else, but it's that starting, that starting point of Google Classroom, which again is true in any of the plans that we are looking at, whether students are remote or in person. On page two, it also mentions code of conduct. I thought, I don't think I mentioned this last week, but I do think it's important. So similarly, even if students are remote, the code of conduct is important and is relative. Students are still expected to follow that and can be held accountable for that. Um, especially sometimes teenagers in, in online interactions forget themselves, I think. And so it's important that students are also adhering to that. Extracurricular activities, I've already heard from several advisors who are working on plans for both remote and in person. Um, those plans would be submitted and approved. And if those extracurriculars are going to be posted, they will do so only under the state guidance, um, DESI's guidance in order to facilitate those different clubs. So we are looking at that. I think, I don't know if you want me to mention it now or later, but I think at some point people might talk about athletics and what uh, remote learning might mean for athletics. I don't have that in my plan because it's not something that we have a firm answer on at this time, but I do know that is on a lot of people's minds. And then of course, um, where students are remote, if they're fully remote, they still have access to counseling services, um, English language services, special education services. And if they are a special population that is also coming into the school, then they can also receive those services in person. So remote in our schedule, because they're following, whether it's that full one or the cohort one, because they're following a schedule, if they usually receive a service during D block, for example, they still receive that service during D block. So that part might also not have been as clear, but because our students are following their schedule and all of those things are already decided for them based on what block, they just continue to receive that service, whether it's remote or whether it's in person at that time. The other extras in our plan um, are really there to sort of help people visualize this a little bit more. So there are three different lessons that I've provided for people. They're all English lessons with different amounts of face-to-face -face time and some different structures so that you could see what exactly a student might be doing during a block and what might be asked of them. And then after that, there's also just some different examples under the different schedules um, with a sample ninth grader as to what that day might look like for them and when they would be taking classes. And it ends with those instructional adaptations, um, which, the, which is also in the, the document from the AGA that went through some bulleted expectations. So again, the remote plan, a lot of it's the same in terms of curriculum and instruction. The schedule can kind of go one of two ways, depending on whether or not those special populations are going to be 
in school at the time, um, but those other pieces, attendance, grading, all of that's the same. And we are sorting out some of the extracurriculars and athletics that people might also be interested in. And I'm happy to take any, any questions about that as well. Hey, April, this is Paul. Um, thank you. I think these examples are really helpful. And I've just got some questions just about the particulars. I apologize, but I still am trying to get my head around how, how it might be different for if we do have some students in person and a teacher in person. Walk me through just how that differs for the person who's the child that's in the classroom versus the child who is staying home and following the same day. Sure. So if the special populations, so under a remote plan where special populations were admitted, the special populations, I assume, uh, although we still haven't sorted it out entirely, would be in a cohort. So they would be supervised by a teacher who is present in the building or a staff member, I should say. We haven't decided on that. <laughs> so a staff member in the building. Um, but all of those students would be going through a course. So if we look at the sample schedule that I have for, I think I called him, what did I name him? Bob Lake. <laughs> if we look at his schedule, and Abe Locke, he has ninth grade English. So April, I'm sorry, just tell me what page you're on. Four. It should be page four. Thank you. Yep. Four or five. They added. Yeah, it's kind of right at the top there. there um, okay. So if if he's into that schedule, right, and he's in English, he's remote. Let's say there's another student, Sally Smith, so I was going to like to use, who's in person. Both of those students will be logging in at 740 in this example, not necessarily everyone all the time every day, but in this example, they would both be logging in to their Zoom for their attendance and their morning instruction. Then their classroom might continue with certain content and activities that could be synchronous and or asynchronous. So that's where you can kind of revert to my classroom example where I had the 100% face time, right? That one's entirely synchronous. That could be an example of what happens. Or there might be some time that's asynchronous in one of the other examples. But both students, whether they're in person or remote, are doing those things at the same time. And that's why following that cohort schedule instead of, of keeping the separate schedule, which Ethan, this may have been your question last week, I realized. Um, but instead of having the two separate ones, they can then be grouped together, right? So they will be in class together. They can partner up. They'll be at the morning meeting at the same time. Otherwise, the schedules don't quite meet. Now their teacher for ninth grade English here, I'm just going to get really specific. I'm sorry, everyone, if, if it bores them, but their teacher for that would be Miss Lanham, right? And so she might be meeting with them in this instance. Um, and then she might be logging off while they're doing asynchronous work. And if she's in the building with a cohort of students, once she's set them up, she then might have a check-in with her cohort of students who, let's say, could be I mean, in the original plan, it would have been ninth graders. So we'll just assume it's the same. Let's say it's ninth grade special population students. Then she checks in with them. Not all of those students might be in her English class at that time. So they might be all in different classes. She says, does anyone need any help with anything? Somebody asks her a science question. She answers that. And then she returns back to her A block English class uh, at another time. So that's kind of how that would function with students both remote and in person. And so that's the same way it would have functioned under that regular in-person cohort. So whether it is everyone admitted or whether it's the special population, it would work the same way. If it's 100% remote, all of the kids were at home. Uh, and so the, the only connection is kind of between those students at that time. You don't have that extra check-in with the other in-person students. And so, it's still the half day because it's the cohort model. So they're departing after lunch. Essentially. Correct. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just for, go ahead. for the benefit of um, folks that are on the meeting, of which there are many, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this, the uncertainty around who will be in the building and who will not is centers really around our needing to um, come to a decision about special populations that will be prioritized for in-person learning. Um, that is not completed yet. We are still deliberating that, working with HEA on that. 
So I'm, I'm saying that as representing the school committee, that this is not something that wasn't accounted for or just we, we are just now thinking about it. It is that we need to finalize what the determination is around those special populations that will be prioritized for in-person learning. Um, those, those are identified by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education in terms of specific groups. And that is what we are going through now in terms of what does that mean for an impact on in-person uh, numbers and quantity in the building. So I just wanna um, put that out there as a, it is ongoing and that's, that's what we're working on uh, as well this week. I just had a quick question for April. Um, I know that the fall is is going to be very different than the spring. Um, I know that in a lot of ways, um, but just one question or comment, I'm not quite sure what it is, um, but I just recall um, being on a previous meeting a while back, I, I just don't remember when, but Jack Kelly had mentioned um, kind of a little bit of uncertainty. And I know again, spring was very different and it was hard to organize. Um, but he had mentioned um, at least having to be able to set up his week's worth. So I know that this is different and that we're going to have a lot more synchronized and um, asynchronized learning, but giving kids in the high school just a, an idea ahead of time, if that's possible for teachers to know what kids can expect for that week. So they have an idea how they need to organize their time, even though we're on a set schedule, just to be able to prepare for kids who maybe want to get a little ahead or just be prepared and know what their week entails just because we are you know starting out remote some kids may be home full-time i don't know if that's possible but just having that plan for the week ahead of time for the kids yeah i appreciate that i think some of that falls into uh what we've mentioned before is the teacher guidelines so it's not necessarily something that we would put into this plan in particular uh but would be a guideline or an expectation uh discussed with an evaluator and a teacher around that effective curriculum and instruction and so i think we're handling it and 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 you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we're handling it from that lens. And so some of that has been discussed. Uh, some examples have been shared with um, faculty members and with the union. Um, but I think that we want to make sure that those pieces stay in the areas of uh, teaching and instruction and separate from the, the plan in terms of specific teachers must do this and this, because that's where we fall into those pieces of negotiation. And, and also, I would just add to that, I think this is a, a good time to remind our, just our entire, to remind parents, to remind everyone of, um, I, I understand when people say, gosh, we don't want the experience to be what it was in the spring. And I would say that uh, the people who probably feel that sentiment the strongest are educators. Um, so one thing that happened in the spring is that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, for good reason, to account for insane inequities across the Commonwealth, put very strict constraints on what could be done. So for example, um, we couldn't exceed uh, more than three hours in a given day. The workload was supposed to be no more than 50% of um, what was normally assigned. Work was not to be graded. Um, that, was, that was not allowed. Uh, and the reason the department did that is because there were places, we left on Friday, March 13th, thinking we would be back in two weeks. And obviously we learned that we weren't going to be back in two weeks, but we were expected to do something by March 17th. Hadley Public Schools did, the educators turned around on a dime, they were ready to go. And they did, they really did an awesome job. Throughout the Commonwealth, I have a colleague in another town, her principals didn't have internet access in their homes because they don't have internet access. So there were, there were towns all over the Commonwealth thrown into remote learning. And that's why that didn't have the capacity to provide remote learning. And Desi recognized that these inequities were going to disproportionately affect certain groups. And so they put together expectations to try to prevent these gaps from becoming insanely wide. So I just, I think it's so easy for people to forget that when we say, gosh, I hope it doesn't look like the spring. I'm going to say again, the people who are saying that the loudest, not students, not parents, but educators are saying that the loudest because they wanted to grade, give feedback, assess, 
follow their regular schedule, engage regularly. So, and that's not just for you, Tara. I think I think sometimes the community is unaware of that reality, and um, it's a given that it will be different. Uh, and some of what happened in the spring was a direct result of the expectations set forth by the department for good reason, right? For good reason. I just felt like it was a useful time to remind the entire public of that. I would add to, uh, I agree with all of that, especially as someone who was teaching during that time. And on a personal note, it wasn't the way I wanted to end my my career teaching either uh, in that spring, but you know, it is, that's what happened. So I would also add that we are seeking input. Um, so we, we already surveyed the faculty about their experience earlier this summer and what worked well, what didn't, how they felt, we also, as some of you may know today, thanks to Bobby, who I can see here, thanks to Bobby Klesch, uh, are in the process of surveying the students as well to get some of their input and use some of that. And that will also be shared with administration and faculty in a summary that will be shared with the school committee at the end of the month. Um, that's also a standard practice, right? A part of regular teacher evaluation is to use student feedback in your educational practices. So we're gonna get some of that. We'll take some of that into consideration. Um, and I think teachers will find that really helpful. And then, uh, you know, to, to the points already made, then teachers will do what they do best and they will they'll learn how to adapt and be flexible and meet the needs of all learners. And just to be clear, I wasn't implying either that it would look different in that teachers are ill-prepared. I mean that we have more time to prepare now and it wasn't an emergency situation. So, and it just, um, the statement that he made just resonated with me, I guess more as a comment that we're just being aware that we wanna make sure that kids do feel um, prepared and adequate too. And it will look different this time and I'm confident it'll be better for everyone. I can go next if that's okay. Yep. You want me to share the plan? That yeah, helpful be wonderful. I, I do want to just kind of reiterate what everybody's speaking about this evening, which is that it isn't going to be the same as it was in the spring. Um, and no one recognizes the hard work that needs to be done more than the teachers. Um, however, you know, I, I do want to make the point that we do have our professional development days that are allotted that are going to be starting August 27th. And I've already had teachers reach out to me, telling me things that they want to explore, um, have a really set schedule. I've been working with April Camuso around some opportunities that we can share across the district, not just at our buildings. And I've also been a part of a Hampshire County principals group that we met today um, in sharing professional development opportunities and ideas so that we can really bring together a, a smart plan an organized plan for families. I'm in constant communication with many families. I, I, I talked to six alone today on my phone, um, not just through email. Email is a different story, but having conversations with families about their concerns about the remote learning and what it's gonna look like for their families um, has, has never been such a bigger discussion than it's obviously happening right now. So I want families to understand that our professional development days are going to be coordinated to make sure that we have support, but also embed time in there so that we're allowed to meet with our families and discuss what the plans are going to look like, discuss what the schedules are going to look like, explore the platforms together so that we're all working, um, towards the same goal, which is to make sure that we have a strong remote learning plan and that families feel confident because just as, just as, as, as much as teachers struggled, families struggled as well. And so we want to make sure that people are having commu communication and conversations with one another right off the bat so that families feel a little bit more confident going in to our remote learning plan. So with that being said, Annie, if you could scroll down to page two, and again, I, I know that I've pretty much already gone over a lot of this in the previous presentations, although I do want to keep saying again and again that we will be following a more typical classroom schedule. If we are 100% remote, we will be starting our day. Um, I'm envisioning and hoping for a morning meeting in each of our, our classrooms. We're responsive classroom trained. And so I've already had conversations with our responsive classroom trained folks um, in the building who would like to do some kind of online um, tutorial for families, but also for staff of what, how we could run morning meetings remotely. 
Um, and so the expectations will be that students will have attendance taken. They will participate in all activities. Um, and then they will have access to services. Um, and I'm sure um, Pam Haywood would be able to speak towards that if, um, if it came up. Um, students will be able to check in with their teachers for attendance as well. Um, if you're out sick, you definitely will be calling in just like you would typically um, if you're a parent of a child who's sick, you're going to let the school know so that we can make sure that that's accounted for. Um, again, our school day will be 825 to 255. Our platform right now is Google Classroom, although I have referenced before that our youngest, um, our, our kindergarten and grade one teachers are still exploring some other options for platforms. I really want to stress the professional development around this. I have the greatest, greatest respect for our teachers. They are creative, innovative. They are constantly exploring things that will meet the needs of their students. Obviously, it's going to be difficult to try to get to know the students in depth right off the bat versus a typical start of the school year. But I have every confidence that the, the classroom teachers are going to be um, working on their individual schedules and also what meets the needs of their students. So again, our platform is going to be Google Classroom, but I, I definitely want to listen to what the teachers have to say, allow for them to be creative with their own um, with the, how they're going to be teaching remotely. Grading and assessment, Annie, if you'd scroll down. Again, we will be adhering to all of our grading policies, all of our assessments will be done. Um, we are looking into FastBridge, that is an assessment tool that we use at the start of the school year, actually multiple times throughout the school year. So we're going to be looking into how we can access that remotely for our students. Again, they've been out of school since March. We really wanna make sure that we know um, where they are academically, not only academically, but socially, emotionally. Um, so grading and assessments are a part of that. It's, um, we're not going to be looking at the 50% criteria any longer. Making sure that we have synchronous and asynchronous times for education, for learning purposes. Again, attendance. Um, I have my summary of HES, student family expectations for in-person or remote students. Obviously, it would be just remote. And then, Annie, if you wanted to scroll down to the schedule that, again, uh, Ms. Jelinas had put together, this would look a little different knowing that we would be going back 100% um, remote in that our specials would maintain their regular special schedule to allow teachers time to um, have their prep time, but also be looking at assessments and grading. Um, so our special schedules will we'll follow a more traditional um, time frame so that each grade level will get one special per day, either art, music, or PE, and will adhere to the the um, the same schedule as or time frame that a typical school day would be, um, and that's about it. Um, if I'll be taking any questions, if you have any. Hey Jen, this is Paul. Thanks for the presentation. So the one. Maybe I'll ask you the same question I asked April. So walk me through, and I, I will say that, you know, just reading through what other schools are doing around the state and around the country, and the little bit I know about pedagogy, that pre-K to three, uh, grade three, or it's a really crucial time. Walk me through how a second grader uh, who might be in the classroom stay is versus a second grader who uh, is at home, how their day might be the same or would it differ? It's a great question, and it's a question that we're constantly asking each other. So if there were um, special populations that would have to come into the building, how would we support them in person? So we're naturally cohorted here at Hadley Elementary School. So we have two grade level teachers for each grade level. So I have two second grade teachers, two third grade teachers, two fourth grade teachers, and so on. And so we would really have to look about, look and see who would be in person, what kind of support staff that would require. But our goal is that they would follow the same schedule in person that they would remotely. Um, and I know that that's a really difficult task for people to get their minds around because how would you have one classroom teacher who would be able to service in in-person students, especially students that might need some additional supports and then also maintain the remote learning population. And so again, it's gonna require some additional staff to support the remote learners. Um, 
we're going to have to get creative with schedules and resources. So it's, it's a great question. Um, but again, I do feel as though during our professional development days, a lot of time is going to be carved out in making specific schedules for each grade level. Cause again, we know our kindergarten group is going to look very different than our fifth grade and sixth grade kids. And what would be the actual, to use your term, synchronous time that a second grader would have with a teacher? Well, I really want um, I really want educational autonomy around what teachers would like to present. So, for instance, if they know that there's a concept that's very tricky and it's a new concept um, or new content rather, um, that they might dedicate more time um, for synchronous learning versus asynchronous activities or um, a video to support that. So it's a, it's a great question. I think it's gonna vary depending on the content. If it's presented something that's a new concept, um, I think back of my, my, when I was a special education teacher in first grade, there were concepts that I had to spend a lot of time on because they were complex. They required a lot of a hand over hand kind of instruction and so, things take longer. Um, and I know that doesn't necessarily answer your question, but it, it should give you a general idea of, um, I really want the teachers to be able to look at their scope and sequence and their curriculum and see what they feel they need to do to be able to organize their time best. I'm sorry, yeah, so I'm sorry to dig into this. Just, I'm, I'm, oh, that's great. I'm, I'm having a hard time just fully understanding. So if there's, there's a teacher and there's half the class just guess numbers, half the class is remote, half the class is in person, mm -hmm. and this is second graders. And so the teacher is teaching simultaneously to both groups. And can I, can I pop in on this, Jen? Because I think I have an example that might be helpful. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. I just need a vivid so picture. Here's, here's, and this is just an example, because I think that Jen is making an important point. I think that teachers are, uh, one, some of these things are things that we're kind of working out right now with the association. So that's important to keep in mind that some of these things are things that are being discussed with the education association. So I'm just giving a general example that builds off of what Jen had said. It may be that when teachers are together for those initial 11 days, keep in mind teachers are contracted to return to work August 27th. So our teachers I know are thinking about this, they're emailing us, they're talking to us. They're technically doing all of that on their own time. Mm -hmm. um, so when they are, when they return to work and they have 11 days, they might sit together, a grade level team might sit together and say, these are the students we know who, if the school committee identifies students who should be um, identified for in-person learning, these are the students we know who will be in person. And these are the students we know who will be remote. Here's how many that we have now. On this particular day or for this particular concept, how about I work for this week's lesson? How about I work with the remote learners for this particular concept and you work with the in-person learners? That's not to say that all students who are prioritized for in-person learning get a specific classroom teacher and all remote learners get a specific classroom teacher. I wanna be very clear around that. That would be impossible to do because for all kinds of reasons, students could be remote or in-person at any time during the year. But could you see, Paul, where a teacher might say, hey, around this concept, we're going to introduce fractions today, and I'm going to dig in with the in-person folks around this, and how about you dig in with, with the remote learners around this? That could be one way that they organize it. I think that's part of what Jen is saying, that teachers would talk with each other and say, what, what makes sense here for this particular lesson, for this particular content, given who we know is going to be in person? present in person for this content and who is going to be remote. Does that help? That's very helpful. Yeah. And, and to build off of that, thank you, Dr. McKenzie. And to build off of that, exactly. A lot of conversations, and that's what I've been saying, are going to have to go into being creative. And so an example like that could be kindergarten where you have, you're constantly doing small group instruction in kindergarten, right? It's teaching the whole mass doesn't usually, I mean, they have a short attention span. So you're constantly meeting in small groups. And so how could we build out a remote schedule um, or a schedule for remote and in-person where the teacher was taking a block of time and working with specific students on, on 
you know, letter or, or vowels, um, and then checking in with the remote people. So it would really, it would have to take a lot of coordination. We'd have to look at resources. Um, again, we'd have to look at what kind of ESP support we could, we could give students. Um, and so, yeah. Does that help answer your question, Paul? That was great, Jen. Thank you. Okay. Are there other questions for Jen? So just a protocol, I see a participant um, raising their hand that uh, Bob Wade, I will call on you in public comment. Um, this is really soliciting for uh, discussion across the school committee and administration as part of this presentation item. Thank you. So Jen, if there's no other questions, maybe I'll jump in again. I'm sorry. Sure. I'm going to be dominating, but the, um, so just to follow that sample uh, student schedule, the, so the, the touch-ins, they're logging in, the fourth is fourth grader, Jane Doe is logging in, checking Google Classroom, has work from 8.30 to, to, to 9.20 mm -hmm. on the Google Classroom. That's asynchronous. This is something she's doing on her own. And it's really the 9.25 to 10.10 period where Jane is interacting uh, via Google Classroom with her teacher. Correct. And that uh, is it until maybe 140 the specials where there's another interaction live with the teacher. Right. I mean, this is just a sample schedule. So it will look a little bit different because Jane Doe could also have um, Title I services. She could have IEP services. She could have things that we're going to have to account for. And so it is just a skeleton type schedule um, because it's going to look different at each grade level. We have math support that would continue for students who struggle with that. So we will have more breakout type um, synchronous opportunities for, for students to be meeting with staff. And then if you also additionally look at the bottom, Paul, the HES remote learning staff support draft plan, this identifies a minimum of three staff members. And of course, we could build off of that depending on what our numbers look like. Um, but it's just gives you an example. It will go for the full day. So I could, I could potentially have staff member A, B, and C working until 255. But it just gives you a sample understanding of what, what we could do with the staff to support students remotely. So you have staff A member touching base with kindergarten Monday, Wednesday, Friday, specific, specifically around English language arts. Um, and so we'll be building off of this again. I really, you know, I, I, I need to trust in, and I do trust in um, my staff to have conversations with not only themselves as a grade level, but they also have to take into account the special educators, um, any kind of title services that are happening, rem rem um, remedial math services that we do offer. Um, so there's a lot that goes into an academic day just outside of the general education teacher, especially at the youngest grades. So if Jane has questions outside of those periods where there's a live teacher, what does she do? If she has questions outside of the live, um, you know, uh, we can build out additional times. There's um, an interesting concept that I've been working on with other um, principals around uh, a win block. It's um, what I need. And so it's almost like a, a study hall for, for students and it's an opportunity to designate a staff member um, hopefully who's familiar, obviously, with the curriculum and content to be touching base with students that might need additional supports. So um, there still needs a lot of work to be done as far as making sure that students have access to teachers during the school day, right? Just, just like they would raise their hand or walk down the hallway and ask, um, you know, if, to clarify a homework question. Um, we would want to try to build those into their, their remote learning days. Great. Thanks, Jen. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the committee? Maybe I'll just ask one. Um, this is we're all in a tough spot. I'm just curious if there was, and Annie, kick me under the table if this is an inappropriate question, but I'm just sort of asking, 
what's the hardest part about this? What can school committee do to help uh, you all be successful, us all be successful here? Um, yeah, I would say, so very hard to kick people under tables uh, in Zoom, but don't worry, it was a great question. <laughs> I'm not sure, I don't think there's a kick under the table icon in Zoom, but it was a great question. Uh, I, um, I would say, and I believe that our community, uh, this was obvious to me from the gratitude that parents expressed in the spring, from the support that parents expressed for our educators and for our administration, Thank you, thank you for all the supportive and kind words that everyone had. And I also know that this is really disconcerting and it's really frightening for everybody, for people who are asking themselves, what am I gonna do in the fall if, if my child doesn't have a regular school schedule? What's going to happen if my child can't access uh, in-person learning to the extent that I feel like he or she needs it or they need it. And other parents saying, what's going to happen when we reopen schools and what's going to happen in the community and what does that mean for public health? I think, I don't think, I think this uncertainty is disconcerting and unnerving for all of us. And I think what we want is to know exactly what everything is going to look like and exactly what is going to happen. And that is just not possible. But I think in that, where we can help each other is we can, we can ask questions, we can ask for clarification, and also we can trust. We can trust our educators really did a wonderful job under really challenging circumstances. And so did our parents, and so did our students. And they are ready to approach this work very differently in the fall because they have been given the ability to do that that wasn't present in the spring. So I think what all of us can do is, is trust and presume positive intentions, that people want to do good work, students and adults, that they will do good work, and when we don't understand why something is unfolding the way that it is, that we have a community that is characterized by really courteous and civil discourse. So we can ask questions and we can get them answered and we can make suggestions and they'll be taken seriously. Um, so what can people do to help? What they're already doing is giving us civil and responsible and supportive feedback, asking hard questions, but not asking them in a way that's hard to hear and, um, and trust and trust, we are working really hard to make sure those buildings are safe, that staff has the time that they need to be well prepared, and, and trust that um, teachers are going to deliver, and our other staff are going to deliver, and our administrators are going to deliver. They are, and that's hard to do. I'm just gonna say that again. I wanna know what tomorrow looks like. I wanna know what September 14th looks like. I wanna know that this is all gonna be over. That's what I want to know. I want somebody to tell me this is all going to be over and give me the date. And when I don't have that, I start to demand certainty out of every single detail I can imagine. Um, but I think we can trust. So that's helpful. Thanks, Annie. Thanks for asking the question, Paul. All right, is there any other um, conversation around the remote learning plan that we need to have tonight? No, but Heather, would it be helpful? I can certainly screen share and tell people where they can find the DESE guidance. I feel like people might be hearing for the first time, even though the school committee absolutely discussed, like there would be children that for that would, would need to access in-person learning. Is it helpful at all? Do you want to speak to the community about that at all, Heather? I don't know, in case people are not fully following um, that part of the conversation. And I'm certainly happy to share that page from the DESE guidance. Is that yeah, I, I think bottom line is that there's guidance from the state as to what populations um, may need to be served through in-person instruction. and 
you know, no, we knew that going into our discussion last week that we can't say 100% remote and completely uh, not address those populations that have been identified by DESE. So that is, that is our next charge. And that's what we um, have be, been beginning discussions on this week. Um, and we intend to conclude those, I think by Thursday mm -hmm. uh, is our charge. So, uh, so those, those would include, um, uh, the screen share, I can. yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, that's not helpful. Give me a second here and it will be helpful in a minute. And I, again, I bring this up because I don't want there to be a misinterpretation that this is um, something that was not acknowledged or is, um, it, you know, not planned for in terms of these, these plans. What needs to be planned for is what impact does this have on our return to in-person instruction and our discussion last week, which I think we um, led with you know, the need for safety uh, in terms of return to in-person instruction, as you see in all of the plans that were presented with cohort-based instruction. Um, and Annie, you can bring it up. Yeah, sorry about that. It just took me a minute to find it. There we go. I had too many tabs open. There you are. This is from, and this guidance, just so people know, this guidance is available um, in, uh, even uh, within the district plan. And uh, it's a public document from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. It's the guidance for remote learning, final uh, gu fall guidance for remote learning. Right. So you, you can imagine that um, populations described here, students with disabilities, English learners, um, intensive needs, um, no access to reliable internet, uh, significantly behind academically disengaged early learners. And what we're doing is looking at what impact does that have in terms of um, numbers that would, uh, frankly, that would be coming back into the building uh, for each of those populations. And so we want to continue to uh, examine that to, in order to provide clarity about um, what in-person instruction, uh, if any, would be taking place in the building and for which populations. Does that help, Annie? I just thought it might be helpful to others who were kind of following along with that. Yeah, and, and to build on that, we would be serving those special populations from day one of school, mm -hmm. September Perfect. 14th. So while yes. we are talking about being a rem having a remote orientation and everyone uh, inside and outside of the school using a tool like Google Classroom to access uh, instructional material and, and uh, educational resources, we're still talking about having a focused group of um, prioritized students uh, for in-person education starting day one in schools that educators be would be working with face-to-face. -face. And Annie, so this is a conversation we're going to wrap up next week, right? Just to be clear, or next but Thursday. I mean. This week. You're also, you're also returning into executive session at the conclusion of this meeting, and then again Thursday publicly, in executive and publicly. Yes. So are we also going to discuss who makes these determinations? Who decides if someone's significantly behind academically? So you would have that discussion, what the criteria are for that, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, as we talked about, some of these things are more formalized than others, right, in terms of... Um, services that are provided, uh, uh, students that are on an individualized educational plan, you know, th those kinds of things are um, quantifiable, trackable, uh, whereas some of these others, we're going to have to discuss what that metric is. Um, disengaged, you know, that may be feedback from a student, that may be feedback from a parent. Those are the kinds of things that we need to talk through. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, we're we're going to after we adjourn, um, we're going to go into public comment after this. After we adjourn this meeting, we're going to go back into executive session uh, to continue the discussion around our, um, uh, frankly, the the bargaining discussion, right, that we are having with yes. HEA, um, of which this is part of it because. Um, determining who's coming back into the building has other effects in terms of uh, staffing requirements, 
Um, and you can imagine where that conversation goes in terms of all of the support staff that support getting those students there or feeding those students, et cetera. So those are all part of the conversation that we're having. Great. So is there anything else on this topic before we move into public comment? I just want to thank our uh, educators, um, both the uh, administration as well as the faculty who have worked, you know, who've turned around in three days a far more um, detailed remote plan than, uh, than I saw originally. And I just have much more confidence that there'll be, um, that this will be a, a strategic and important move for all our learners uh, across the board. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thanks, Humara. All right, with that, I'm gonna move into public comment. Um, again, if you'd like to participate, please raise your digital hand uh, or turn on your video and wave and I'll call on you. Um, Bob Wade, you had originally been waving to us, so I'm gonna call on you first and then I see another hand up. So Bob. Hi, um, thank you for the earlier clarification about the special populations and um, just the ongoing discussion about the criteria for being identified as part of a special population uh, for consideration for on-site learning. Um, I was wondering, have you been given any structural guidelines or specifications um, for numbers for uh, potential on-site learning? Do you have minimum or maximum number of students that, that you've been um, given specs for? So Bob, because public comment is is really not a Q and A session, I, I will address that um, we are examining numbers of what the impact would be for each of those populations by grade um, into what that would look like for the buildings, um, both buildings separately. Uh, also, I think that we can say that. Uh, for anything where we talked about might be less defined, uh, we need to lay out what those metrics were, where, how did we, if, if uh, disengaged students become part of that in-person instruction opportunity, that we lay out what that means. How did we define that? Um, how did we, how were we able to come to that conclusion? I think that is, you know, part of our responsibility to be able to say that. Anything else, Bob? I'm sorry. I Okay. Uh, Lindsay, you have your digital hand up. Uh, so I was wondering if somebody could address um, the working parents that can't have their kids on at a certain time, like when you want them to all log in in the morning, um, if we can't log them on at that time, then what happens? I think that will, again, um, that will need to be addressed in the plan in terms of attendance. Um, and I, I thank you for the comment. I'll make sure that we have addressed that in terms of that scenario or a, a kind of like an FAQ. What do we do? Anything else, Lindsay? No, that's all. Okay, thank you. Maureen? Yes, I just wanted to address what Paul was asking about earlier, because after last spring, just seeing how many children have questions that get answered almost immediately, students can comment in Google Classroom, they can ask, they can put in private comments to their teacher, and that goes to their classroom teacher, it goes to me, and it goes to most of the ESPs who are associated with that class. So at any time, they, they have up to a half a dozen different adults who are ready and available to answer their questions. So it's not like they only have 20 minutes here and 20 minutes there. They actually get answered all day long and half the night. That's really helpful. Thanks, Maureen. I didn't, I didn't realize that, so I appreciate that. Thanks. Thanks, Maureen. Are there any other public comments? Um, Christine Kelly. 
I was wondering if our students aren't recognized as a child who is going to be in person because they don't meet the criteria now. If we have a student who, let's say, four weeks in is horribly struggling and not performing, is that something that we can address with the school and they can be brought into in-person learning at that point if that's necessary? That's a great comment, Christine. So when we address uh, our populations uh, for in-person instruction, prioritized uh, populations, we need to address uh, students that move into those groups throughout the school year. Thank you, Christine. Are there additional uh, public comments for tonight? Um, Steve? Hi, thank you so much. I um, would love to ask a question, but I'll try to comply with a, a comment. But I think um, I would just really encourage the school committee and the district leadership to, I'm sure you're looking at lots of different plans, but in looking at some other communities around Massachusetts, um, Methuen in particular, um, I think took a pretty unique approach to thinking about different grade levels and they actually prioritized um, for them it's a high school their ninth graders sort of a new very new experience for them and they didn't just go by elementary school students um, sort of the youngest um, so I, I would encourage you to, to check out their plan I think it was really thoughtful and creative um, and additionally I would um, to the extent that you're able I think the guidance is, is interesting from Desi however I think um, I don't think it's a controversial statement that the difference between uh, kindergartners experience and ability to be able to work synchronously, um, especially with a working parent or parents um, is going to be very different than a fifth grader. Um, and so I find that guidance a bit blunt, honestly, uh, for that moment. And I would encourage the committee and the Russell. district leadership to not necessarily bundle uh, that broad of a group together um, just because it's how our elementary schools in some places have been organized. Thank you, Steve. Meg Kane. Hello. I just wanted to tag on the last couple of comments. Um, when we're thinking about having the students, both from the little guys all the way up through high school, um, making sure they have plenty of time for question asking and even different formats, like sending a question through Google, Google Classrooms. I am encouraging administration and teachers and everyone to remember that uh, for a lot of kids, reaching out and asking for help itself is a challenge. So just, I feel like it's just needed to be remembered. It's not enough to say, oh, we have ample time for the students to reach out and get help. I hope we are remembering that the kids need teachers to reach out to them as well. And, you know, especially if parents are not in the home or um, maybe they're working a little bit independently. As a parent, you don't always know that they're struggling because they're not so quick to speak up and say they're struggling. So, um, you know, I had one child that just kind of, actually both of them started like falling away because I, and I had no idea that they were struggling with certain things. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see no other hands raised. I do see one phone participant um, ending in 9882. If you uh, would like to make a public comment, you can come off mute and do so. Okay. Great. Well, I will. Con uh, oh, we had Paul. Uh, Paul Jekinowski. Paul, do you have a comment? Uh, hello. Hi, Paul. Oh, hi. Sorry, uh, I'm just fiddling with my phone. Um, well, I've uh, been listening to all this discussion. Well, th the last couple meetings. And one idea I thought might be nice is if we kicked off this whole school year with, uh, with an in-person orientation um, 
it, the, the weather is going to be beautiful <clears throat> in September. And if every grade could meet, you know, at some allotted time, whether it be in the gymnasium or outside on one of the playing fields and have, have the teachers there uh, explaining to these kids what's going to be going on. Um, <clears throat> Cause as it is now, um, I mean, my, my kids know the plan. I have one, one boy in eighth grade and one going into sixth and they're, uh, under the strong impression that they're going to be going back to school in six weeks. So that's kind of what they're looking forward to. But I think it would be for the kids' benefits if if they had that moment in time to be given the charge as to what is expected of them, uh, how it's going to work, and so that they're not just treated right off the bat as, as virtual objects. Um, and I think it would be a, a good way to, to get this started and uh, maybe lessen the fear a little bit for if and when they do uh, make it into the classroom. Uh, that, that, that's all I have to say. Thank you for the suggestion, Paul. Okay. Um, seeing no other hands raised at this point, uh, what I'm going to do then is move into, um, I, I do not believe we have an action item for tonight. Um, we're going to move into just recapping our next meeting dates. Uh, hey, Heather, can I just interrupt real quick just to say yeah. I was texted a question um, um, about following up. I think I'd ask a question about the amount of synchronous time a second grader might ask. And just more of those questions about a Hopkins student. Are there specifics on how that's set? Um, are there minimum standards established? April, I think you ran through that in your uh, in the schematic, right, in your presentation. That it might vary, though, based on the the day and the the class. Yeah, I provided examples. There are no uh, specific. There's no specific standards such as like every teacher must meet synchronously for this amount of time for this many classes. So those standards don't exist for the, the reasons that I mentioned before. Teachers have been, they've, they have guidelines shared with them and thinking about it like best practices, just like we would in-person instruction. Um, but a lot of their ability in terms of synchronous time will depend on uh, those special populations as well. Um, and a variety of other things, even what was even what Jen mentioned in terms of prioritizing certain more complex content and thinking about that. So there won't ever be one exact standard. Uh, it'll vary. Thanks, April. Sorry, Heather. No worries. All right, I'm gonna move then into our recap of our next meeting dates. You guys will be very sick of us by the end of the, the month. Um, we have a lot of meetings planned. We're gonna adjourn this meeting and go into executive session. We are also meeting um, on August 13th, that's this Thursday. We have executive session planned before that meeting as well as uh, a subsequent school committee meeting uh, where we want to finalize the remote learning plans, including um, special populations for in-person return. And um, all of that, as we said last week, is contingent upon agreement with HEA. So that's what we are doing in these executive sessions is discussing um, what this means in terms of an impact to HEA. Um, we will then also meet August 24th as what we would have normally done as a retreat which sounds really nice right now, but uh, we'll be retreating on Zoom and discussing the district strategy and, a, and superintendent goals. And then we'll have our regular meeting August 31st. Um, throughout all of those, as you know, we will continue to have public comment. Um, we will continue to examine uh, changes, uh, updates in information provided by the state or information um, with regards to health and safety metrics. So. All of those things uh, will be part of our considerations as we move forward. Um, but I think that that's a recap of where we're at. Is there anything else uh, from the committee before we, before I ask for a motion to uh, adjourn into executive session 
to move into executive session and to adjourn the meeting after that session concludes. Okay, if no questions, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All Second. in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, we will now adjourn, sorry, move into executive session. And after the conclusion of executive session, we will adjourn uh, the meeting. Thank you very much to our participants for joining us. We will see you Thursday. <laughs>